on a, I want to say on a tradition level, yes, it is true that on a tradition level, we cannot distinguish between the two. Uh, there, there is a, I don't know if there's criteria to do that. But on a historiograph, the historiographical task is much larger than just working with the tradition. And so uh, it's interesting that Zeb agrees with us that the criteria of authenticity, which characterize the so-called new quest, are broken. But he steps back and says, we're back in the no quest. I, can, I, can, I won't speak for Anthony LaDon very often, but on this I will. Uh, we both wouldn't take, our, our point is that we can go forward with the quest, just not with, not with the criteria. The, the point is not that the quest isn't, isn't possible, it's that that particular quest isn't possible. Um, Raphael, I largely agree with, so I'll skip over. That's why you copied my paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with Paul, uh, I, I, as, much, as, as shiny as I appreciate that halo is, Paul, I think that, I think that you're, to skip to it, I think your problem is with Richard Bockham, not with social memory theory. Uh, and in my opinion, I, I, I don't care how many awards and books won or how big a scholar it is, I care about the argument. And I don't think that his arguments work, and we agree on that. And I don't think that memory itself does what he wants it to do, although that book is a brilliant book and I liked it. But the memory section itself, I thought, would, I, I agree with you, it doesn't work like that. Uh, but, you know, if, if you were raised to stick to the point one is making, I have to ask then, you know, your point in that article was that those who employ memory and historical Jesus research do these things. And you elsewhere, well, elsewhere say, New Testament scholars who use memory theory have these apologetic purposes. And so my only encouragement is, I, I think that you've been, you would have been more on task just to say, Bauckham does this. Bauckham does this. Because there's a plethora of people using memory studies for historical Jesus research, or at least they think so, who don't do that. So, so uh, I think our disagreement is much smaller, actually, than that might have uh, indicated. Uh, and in reality, the disagreement kind of points to an agreement that we both think that that particular deployment of memory studies doesn't work. But what other people, there's, there's a vast sea of people who are doing it. Yeah. I want to respond primarily to, um, to Raphael, um, which is to say that, um, so he said that um, the goal is still the same, that is knowledge about Jesus. And I just want to point out that um, Knowledge about Jesus is a claim. If you arrive at knowledge about Jesus, then you are making a claim of authenticity. That this, we know something about Jesus because Jesus did this, or something like this, or said this. Um, which actually is going back to the thing he's claiming as part of this book, the, the, the mind of authenticity, that he's moving away from. You can't, you can't um, claim to be moving away from an interest in authenticity and claim to come away knowing something about Jesus because that conclusion is going to be a claim about authenticity. So in his, in, in his paper was good because good it offered an illustration of how he thinks one can use memory theory to do the new historical Jesus research. But um, to come to the conclusion that he does about Luke's Nazareth story, to, to come to the conclusion that there's that there's something reliable there. You can strip away, as he does, the things that he thinks are unreliable. So to come to that conclusion, you have to start from the default position that memory is inherently reliable. And the work on memory distortion shows that that's not an appropriate or defensible default position. Um, so again, to go back to the point of my paper, we can't, that's a perfectly mundane story, and I have no idea if it happened or if it didn't happen, but to, but to come to the conclusion he did, you have to assume that the basic reliability of that story is intact. And how do we know that? Memory distortion studies show we can't know it. We have no means to make that assumption. Then he asks, why Jesus? Why, why, did, the, why did these memories adhere to this person? And on the surface, that's such a a reasonable and rational question, but in the, 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 the article that I wrote for journal for the, the study of the historical Jesus last year, the question can be turned around, why Ned Ludd? Ned Ludd, the leader, the, the technophobic leader of the, of the Luddites, um, to whom adhered all sorts of biographical details and fantastic stories, and British historians of the 19th century um, Industrial Revolution are unanimous, he didn't exist. There was no Ned Ludd. So asking why Jesus makes no sense. 
It's not to claim there was no historical Jesus. It's to illustrate that, that details and stories and, and, and memories adhere to people who didn't exist. And if that's possible, then actually, why Jesus isn't a meaningful question. And then finally, I would close to say that, that um, as he said, historians, and I think Chris said this as well, historians have to, they must, explain the origins of these memories. And I say, no, they don't. They might. They can. That's one of the things historians can do. But there's no must there. Um, and that in the end, if you have, actually to respond to Chris's response, um, you can't have a quest without criteria. The criteria were the core of the quest. And so I'm not saying we're done talking about Jesus. And I think both of you guys have much left to say about Jesus. But, but what I would argue is that's not a quest anymore. That's, that's interest in how Jesus was remembered by earliest Christians. But it's not a quest for the historical Jesus. I think what you guys are doing, in the end, you, you're not changing the game. You're basically doing the same game. You're just using memory theory to do it. I'm not sure that, that can be done. Yeah, I'd, li I'd, li I'd like to. I'd like to also be thankful uh, uh, for the responses. Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not really sure where to begin because I'm taken. I'm, I'm pushed back on my heels a little bit uh, by that. I don't think. It, I don't think at all that I'm uh, that um, uh, pursuing knowledge about Jesus assumes the 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 authenticity and authentic uh, authentic inauthentic um, dichotomy that I'm that I'm suggesting is is problematic. Um, and I think that the story of uh, of uh, Luke's uh, Nazareth book is a great example of the way that the binary opposition is not useful, and yet we can still come to ask questions and produce knowledge about Jesus. Now, of course, not not knowledge as as uh, uh, sure and um, verifiable as what color is this podium. Um, but I I didn't at all, uh, and I don't at all uh, strip away the inauthentic. Uh, bits from Luke 4 to say, here are the bits that are left. I'm rather interested in the way that Luke <coughs> produces this image, what he does with it, and also what are the things about the Jesus tradition that suggest people were uh, open and receptive to accepting this image, that there were constraints in Luke's ability to first imagine such a thing, and then also constraints in his ability to convince others that such things were worth uh, imagining. Um, this is different than suggesting that this or that uh, is, is authentic. But to, um, to get away from defending me and back to attacking you, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fundamental problem in the way that you talk about uh, memory and the past um, with phrases like uh, um, uh, the act of remembering changes what the past means or that uh, in your list of seven uh, causes of, of distortion, that the first four do not attempt to change the past, but the, but the remaining three do. And there's a subtle assumption that the past meant something, and the problem with distortion is that we're altering that. And the point of memory theory is that the perception of the present, as, uh, as uh, 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 Chris alluded to but didn't, uh, um, didn't expound, the perception of the present, and then the recall of that through throughout the ever unfolding present is always an act of interpretation. There is no base level, this is what it means, and then somebody else is going to come and muck with that, and our job is to, un, to uh, uh, undo that. And at its base, the, I think the, the problem is that you talk about memory as if it's a thing rather than a process, and accounting for memory is a process, and not necessarily working back through it, but accounting for it enables us to know about the past, and it just does. Uh, there's, there's, um, there are lots of pro documented and, uh, and verifiable problems with memory. The fact is, we still operate as if our images of the past bear some relationship to the past. If I go, uh, if I go back to Knoxville, Tennessee, and get caught kissing some girl, and then when my wife beats me over the head with a frying pan, I say, I'm sorry, babe, I forgot what you look like, uh, she won't accept that, because memory is reliable enough that she expects me to know who she is. Um, that was too much information. It was a little bit, wasn't it? Uh, that's the, I find lines by crossing them. Let me step back. It was your uh, excuse, right? Um, Paul, I, 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 I'm, I'm really appreciative of some of the things 
that you say and even agree with you. I, I for Zeb, actually, I reviewed uh, Professor Buckham's book and found his discussion of memory highly problematic. And so I appreciate your um, uh, your highlighting of those problems um, in, 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 in convincing ways. I just I think I just want to echo Chris's problem that the that the, the title um, the title of your essay is. Um, uh, uh, suggests that memory is a dead end in, his, in uh, Jesus' historiography. And uh, as somebody who thinks he's doing Jesus' historiography and using memory to do it, um, I can't help but feel <coughs> included in your criticisms of Bauckham. Um, I think that's all I have to say about that. Oh. <coughs> Back so soon, I didn't expect to be one. <laughs> Well, let's spice it up a bit. I think all three of you are wrong um, for different reasons. Um, I, I actually do think that Chris and Raphael are doing historical Jesus research. I think they're doing historical research into the transmission of the Jesus tradition. And that's why I don't include you in, in that title, because I don't see what you're doing fits in with what has been understood by historical Jesus research for 150 years. If you want to say the rules have changed, you either need to get a new title for your game or say, you know, this is legitimate historical Jesus research. I'm not convinced with Zeb that we can't play the game anymore. I think, you know, if we stepped outside, dare we think of the rarefied atmosphere of SBL, the average person would still want to ask us learned scholars so did Jesus do it or not? And I don't think that's a stupid question to ask from a, a wider society that's wanting to know why people are committed to this figure still. You know, if we can have no certainty about the actuality of events, what is the relevance of what we're doing here in a way? I, I don't think we can get a lot of traction because of the nature of our sources. But I, I'd just like to ask people, um, you know, some questions, so to Chris and to um, Raphael, you know, I mean, did the saints walk around in Matthew 27? Were they raised from the dead? I, how does memory, that's remembered, so in Matthew's Gospel, does memory help me to know if that's true or not? In the Gospel of Peter, another community based at Rossos, if that's right, remembers, or they pass on as their memory, that when Jesus was raised from the dead, a cross came out of the tomb and spoke. Now, I think that says something really historically important about the type of piety people in the second century had. I don't think it says anything about the historical Jesus. And memory is no use to me in answering that question. I look at tendencies in wider society, what factors are going on, and, you know, we could multiply the examples there, um, you know, the birth narratives or, or the cleansing of the temple, remembered in John's Gospel to have happened at the start of the ministry. Can you, was it at the start or at the end? How do I determine which memory is the better there? They're two different memories, and I think we can analyze that as traditions that have been preserved to sustain the Jernine community or various synoptic communities. But I want to know, A, did Jesus cleanse the temple? B, did he cleanse it at the beginning of his ministry? Or was it one of the events during the last week that may have contributed to his death? These are legitimate historical questions. And I don't think memory gets me anywhere near them. I think it answers a different set of important questions. So in the end, I maintain I wasn't criticizing you because you weren't doing historical Jesus research. And there are other people apart from Borkham who do that kind of thing. Um, Marcus Botmuel, in his um, Peter Remembered books, makes similar claims about memories and historicity. So it wasn't just Borkham, and we've mentioned a few other names there. So I just think you're playing a different game, which is an important one. And you know that's my basic critique, of, I think, of the discussion. So I hope I've given us enough to disagree with for a bit more discussion. James, since he has... Not that they've got chance. Uh, since he asked a question, can we answer it real quick? Okay, go on. Uh, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make it fast. This will be very quick. Uh, thank you, Paul, because I think that your articulation of those questions really does get to the issue. Okay, what does it do? 
the question about the saints walking around. Of course, I don't think that's historical. I don't think that saints actually walked around Jerusalem. But the question that social memory theory forces you to ask is not, did this ever happen? But why did Matthew in the first century present it as if it did? Why did they think about Jesus in, in his activities in these terms? But now, it's not a historical Jesus question. Yes, but the problem of that is not with memory. The problem is with human knowledge. We're not going to answer that question with it to, to our utter, utter conviction as historians because that type of que a question like that is based on someone's belief in the supernatural, etc. So, but my point is, memory itself does not answer, did saints walk around? It, it forces you to ask, why did they think about Jesus in this way? And there's lots of historical information to be gained from answering that question, right? So, but the fact that men like but historical information about Jesus, not just about his followers, about both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah not just. That's so, for the ten, for for example, the temple cleansing, the it, asking about the temple cleansing. What memory asks you to do is not is not to choose this one or that one, but whatever scenario you propose as a historical scenario needs to explain why they thought both things, why both types of trajectories exist. Now, it may very well be in the midst of explaining that we come to the conclusion. One of them could never have happened and the other could have. I've done these arguments myself. But what memory theory does is structure the, structure the way you go about answering the question. It doesn't answer the question for you. So right, that's my response. <laughs> okay, question. I think actually it comes with you on the other because you have the first. Can you, uh, can you speak up as well? Yeah, I have a question I would like you to, to, to avoid avoiding. Uh, now, it, it, an important point of departure for historical Jesus studies is, is how do we move from social <coughs> tradition to history? Now, we're learning that criteria, the traditional criteria, don't do the job well. So the question is then, do memory studies do the job? Or are memory studies just a different take on tradition? Uh, if the latter is true, we're back to square one. So how do we move from whatever we call it, memory, distorted memories, or traditions, or sources, or whatever, you know, title we give this, name we give this, uh, which is our, our, our material to work with, how do we move from that to history? So is social memory just, just a variant of tradition? And if so, what are we really discussing? I think the com I think what's what's what what's different about memory theory as opposed to tradition in the form critical way is that tradition assumed that you could separate fact from fiction, right? Or layers of of, of embellishment from a, from an original. And memory theory, one of the contributions of memory theory <coughs> is to say that you you, you can't do that. It's, it's, it's an entirely interpretive. So it's an extension. Yeah, but of we work with tradition for. We, we, many people have worked with tradition for decades without assuming that dichotomy that we call it. So, so um, what's the difference between tradition in a broader sense? Uh, well, I'll say quickly what. The form for a assumed that memory was something that reflected essentially accurate representation of the past in the minds of people, and then tradition grew from it and then included interpretations that involve the present, right? In reality, what memory theory does in many respects is pushes that tradition stage up to the front and says at the very beginning they were interpreting these in particular categories. That there, in other words, this distinction between memory and tradition is not nearly as clean as a lot of scholars have thought because there's a lot more overlap. So I don't know if that answers the question. I know we Yeah, let me. Well, I, I just want to say I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what you're getting at, but I think that the difference is that tradition isn't tradition isn't the obstacle to be overcome in doing history. Tradition is the vehicle that I that enables me to know about history. Yeah. Uh, that's, Even if limited. Yeah. Okay, we've got here, then here, then here, then here. <laughs> no, I'm, Well, um, 
memory distortion theorists are quite clear that while all memory is distorted, some memories are more distorted than others. So the lab work is showing, is for, for instance, when you, when you do a lab test where you get an adult to reconstruct a childhood story that never happened to them, you're, you know that it didn't happen to them because, because you're, 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 you're telling them a story that, that their parents assure you this has never happened to them. You tell the person this happened to you, tell us about it. At first they like, I have no recollection. A week later, they're starting to form recollections. Two weeks later, they've got this grand narrative of this thing that never happened to them. So yeah, those memory theorists are assuming because they have evidence that this thing didn't happen and then here's this manufactured memory of it that is, you know, that can be created, that can be implanted in the person. So yes, flatly, some things happen, and some things, and and sometimes um, um, memories about that are accurate, and sometimes they're not accurate. Uh, I think uh, it is important to uh, avoid a misunderstanding here. I think that there is a misunderstanding involved. Um, the memory studies, as they were applied to historical people research, were never meant to replace historical critical research. It was never the aim of, uh, of memory studies. It is not a historical method. Memory studies are not a historical method, but it's a hermeneutical perspective. And this hermeneutical perspective was developed in the late 18th and 19th century together with historical critical research. And uh, the um, clue is that by critical scrutiny of the sources, you will never get an image of the past. You will get an uh, inscription and a coin and a literary source, but you will, you will never get an image of the past. What you need to have an image of, an, of a person of the past or, or of a specific event of the past and so forth <coughs> is you, you have to use your own, as Collingwood called it, creative imagination. And this, uh, this uh, specific perspective was developed in the 19th century by Johann Gustav Reusen and Wilhelm von Humboldt and later Robert Collingwood uh, picked that, that, that uh, trajectory up. And that means that in doing history, we always have to use our own creative imagination to interpret the source. And this is what uh, memory means, as, we, as I understand it, and uh, many others as well. We have to, to use our, our imagination to, to create a picture of the past. That does not mean that, uh, it, uh, that it's not important to evaluate the sources critically. That is not an alternative. But you have to distinguish between critical methods as it has to be applied to the sources. There is no doubt about that. And they have a musical perspective that we use to do that. And I think it is important to make clear this hermeneutical reflection on what we are doing when we work as historians. And we have to distinguish between these uh, two levels. It's just that in this case, the hermeneutical perspective renders um, distinguishing between patently um, um, manufactured memory and perfectly plausible memory from the Gospel of Matthew indistinguishable. But, but only, in a very, only in a very na narrow way. <laughs> and, 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 the, and the point is, you don't know that at the outset. This is, this is why I said in my paper, mem memory theory does not do the work for the historian. It only, it only, talk, it only addresses how you're going to handle the sources as interpreted sources. So Except we don't have tools left. You, you guys took the tools away from us. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have we don't have always used to distinguish uh, between... Yes, no. No. If you, for example, if you look at Johann Gustav Reusen, he was a very critical historian, and he evaluated all his sources very critically. But by the same time, he had an idea of what he is doing when he creates, for example, a picture of what he calls Hellenism. But there is no, there, there's just not, not, a, not a contradiction. The critical evaluation of the sources and the hermeneutical reflection on what we are doing when we create a picture of Jesus, that is not a, a contradiction, it's not an alternative. And, that, and that's right, it's not a country. What, what's maddening about this discussion is that both, both uh, uh, Zeba and Paul say, well, here's the rules of historical Jesus research, and you're not following those rules, and so you're not doing historical Jesus research. And both Chris and I have stood up here and said, those rules are bankrupt. 
But knowledge about Jesus is not pushed off the table. Rather, there are other ways of getting at that knowledge. There are other questions to ask, other perspectives at work. And we've talked about those things. And rather than engaging what we've said, you both said, well, you're not playing that game, so you're not doing historical Jesus research. And that's maddening. No, no, I, I, I respond Paul, to Paul, that. I think <laughs> Paul's going to intervene here. Just because something's maddening doesn't mean that it's wrong. I mean, can I, can it, but, 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 but how, how are we going to decide? What I'm saying is, I've given a list of citations about what has traditionally been understood as historical Jesus. You're saying you're doing it at the moment, historical no, no, Jesus. No, I cited some of those same sources and said, that is not the game to be played. But, so we actually so, agree that we're not Yes, agreeing we're agreeing with you, with you but, but then you don't... You don't what I'm what saying is... The basic question of historical Jesus research that most people would want to know is not about hermeneutical opportunities, because they'd have a difficulty, dis I guess, distinguishing fantasy from fact. So what people want to know is how reliable are these traditions? And I, I think Zeb is entirely right. Memory can be distorted, but the basic question or problem is how do we distort or separate reliable memories from very creative, helpful memories that function really well for pastoral communities. I mean, you know, some of the material in John's farewell discourse isn't, has ongoing relevance to believing communities may be facing times of crisis. And so I want to hang on to that. That is a huge hermeneutical opportunity. If I want to ask, did Jesus ever say anything like that? I, I, I'm struggling to see how your method helps me to answer that question. I think what you're saying to me is that question should no longer be on the table. And I, I think this is a fundamental question that most people would want answered. I think your method answers some very good or important questions, but not those fundamental historical ones. So that's why I think you're doing Jesus research but not historical Jesus. That's what I think my problem is. If you can help me understand that, I'd be grateful. Not just yeah, now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, um, to my fellow person from Ottawa, Deb, uh, I agree with you except for your conclusion, unfortunately. Um, while there are many reasons, instances where memory can be distorted, there's also many scenarios and situations where there are accurate memories. Um, for example, people who get together every week and sing songs in a park, they, act, they actually memorize words. Or I think anyone in this room will probably give an accurate, you know, short, brief account of the two source hypothesis. And these things especially occur in teaching situations. So to say I, I decided to become a no question, I followed St. Deb, and spent six months, maybe a year, following around, and we sort of, you know, actually went around teaching the good news that the quest is over. You know, I think over that time I have a, quite an accurate uh, grasp of your teaching. In fact, so accurate you may even send me out to do other stuff. And it may become a situation where you visit Toronto and a crack smoking follower of Bob Ford assassinates you. And we decide to continue the teaching. There's a group of us who continue to meet on a regular basis. And, you know, we, we suddenly realize that, oh, it's not just saints there. Is the embodiment of wisdom. And we could like carry on sort of you know, passing on your teaching accurately and it came from you. And would it be likely distorted? Now there are going to be things that are distorted, but I think you could create a scenario where you could have quite accurate passing on the tradition. Okay, and so, so I am not being heard if I'm being told that memory is works most of the I don't know how many more times I could have said that in this paper. Memory works well most of the time. I'm not claiming, I didn't claim at any point that memory is inherently unreliable. So one of the responses from Chris or Raphael that said that this, uh, set up this false dichotomy of the reliable, the Gospels aren't totally reliable, but neither are they totally unreliable, that dichotomy didn't come from my paper. Um, my point was that memory theorists, studies show time and again that, that, that the person who holds the memory that they have cannot distinguish themselves between the reliable and the unreliable ones. And we, at, an ex at a distance, 
are also unable to distinguish between them. It's, and so, memory works a lot of the time, but we can't tell when it's working and when it's not. But you can create a scenario, if it, if it, if it fits a scenario where there's going to be high distortion or low distortion according to memory theory. I think we need to define also, in memory theory, distortion does not refer to some type of qualitative assessment. I, I'm not assuming that you think this. It doesn't refer to a qualitative assessment like there's a pristine accuracy and then it's just memory is distorted from it. Uh, distortion refers to uh, the interpretive frameworks that are there that are necessary for the articulation of the past in any case. So the point is not necessarily in reality. There's not not when we're talking about the Gospels, there's no such thing as non-distorted tradition. Not just the Gospels, period. It's all distorted. But that can't be used as a cop-out either. Because some memories are clearly vastly more distorted than others. But that's and true. And that's, the and that's why the theory itself doesn't answer that question. The other issue is that early Christianity didn't happen in a laboratory. So what's most, what's most important is to talk about how the transmission actually occurs in the places where we can observe it. And there's more to this, and there's more to the story about the way that memories are distorted. I think. Oh, so I, I you think. Want us to respond to that. Yeah, yeah, but other people have got questions to ask. So, um, <laughs> uh, uh, can your questions short and your answers short, if this is humanly possible? <laughs> Excellent example of uh, distortion of memory is a German book, Opa Bar Doch Kein Nach, but the Kranta was not pronounced. There are family memories that are developed over decades. Speak out of it. Family memories developed over decades about those who lived in the Nazi era that actually when they were, you know, informing Nazi officials about the Jews, they became benefactors of the Jews in the end of the war. So, one statement. Uh, my question is about the role of the storytellers and narrators in this process, because it, you seem to, to uh, seem to least suppose a situation that Tom Wright describes, that there is a group of Christians and Somebody comes there with Jesus and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. It isn't. It is informed, uh, controlled <coughs> environment. And there is a sort of passive uh, controlled environment there where everybody seems to know what Jesus said. And there is a positive uh, memory going on. But I think storytellers very often have to um, reform the traditions they are transmitting. There is a positive impulse. That. So it, it's a positive thing to tell a story in another way, combine stories and make a new point. And, and there is absolutely, they, the first Christians didn't think that a, as a forgery or something bad. And, and it's, it's, I think it's quite natural to understand why several words of Jesus have been created and, and, and stories have been transformed and, and created out of nothing. Even, even that might happen, and I think it, it's a positive development. And uh, I am rather positive about the historical scholarship to find out such tendencies in the tradition. So, but how would you relate that to the... Women? I don't know which two guys you thought were assuming Tom Wright's model, but I just want to say that I wasn't. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's all right, because I, I, I just posed the question of... Yeah. Uh, because <coughs> I hear you saying that it's a sort of collective process. And, and it, there is a rather good control in that. But once you have a storyteller who, who carries on with the tradition, right. he has the responsibility to shape it. Yes. So it's not just you know, keeping it intact and telling it the same, in the same way all over again, but creativity is a positive feature right. for a storyteller. And if, if the charismatic storyteller, like I think Luke was, the, uh, Point the taken. Story, then she oh. shapes them again. And that's why I think Luke. The, the, the source for the um, uh, author loop is loop. Okay. <laughs> okay, 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 point taken, answer. We, we, we have, we, I think we have a problem with the, with the understanding of the word collective because what, uh, certainly what, what Chris and I are saying is not that uh, collective memory is people remembering together that there are these natural communal controls that when somebody starts to move uh, beyond the pale of what's acceptable, that will, uh, that will get reined in. Uh, certainly that can happen sometimes, certainly it doesn't happen sometimes, and, and particularly in the Christian tradition. The point, about, uh, the point about collective is that even in the creative uh, uh, shaping and development, and, and maybe even creation of tradition, there are patterns and schemes and, um, and frameworks in place that the person, uh, that, the, the, that the storyteller is not working from um, um, 
a, a, a blank slate. There's um, there, there was a car commercial a, a, a few years ago uh, in the states where where you see a, a, a man or a woman uh, and just completely in white. There's no there's no floor. There's no walls. And she says or he says or whatever. Uh, I'm looking for a car, and then bam, all these millions of cars come up, and then uh, no, I want a red one, and then we're not we're not working from nothing to create. But there are already established there are already established patterns and schemes, and so the question is how how can we how can we um, witness these things that work, and how did uh, how did uh, Jesus and his uh, how did Jesus already um, uh, function as part of those frameworks to constrain not just the preservation of knowledge about him, but even even serve as the impulse sometimes for the creation of those things, as for example, Luke's image of Jesus reading in the synagogue in the pulpit. No, no, no. I want to answer that guy's question. That, that, quickly. Yeah, I will do it quickly. I want to affirm one of the, 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 the magic and power of memory is that it does exactly what you, what you said. It reconstructs and keeps it relevant and it reshapes it and, it, and, it, and it's awesome and it's huge. That's great. But if the historian wants to go back and try to figure out what actually happened, then, then that becomes a problem. It's not a problem in and of itself, it's the power of memory. But it becomes a problem for the historian who actually wants to know what happened, not how was it remembered. Fine. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, my question is for Dr. Foster. Can you turn the question on uh, Keith Rodriguez's book? How, like, you know, after all question, somebody asks, so Matthew, they were the same, because they know the, the uh, cleansing of the temple of John. So if you remove memory theory, the question, how do you answer that question? Somebody's asked the pastoral question. Just as a story. All right, um, I guess to take the example of the dead saints, it's only in Matthew's gospel. It fits, so there's a redactional issue there. I don't see it in Matthew's sources. It fits in with Matthew's apocalyptic worldview. Therefore, I think Matthew has created that event but his theological agenda. I don't think it goes back historically, and I think historical arguments help me to answer that. Okay. Okay, Ronald. Well, well. uh, I understand the aspect of performance that there is in, in memory, but I'm wondering also if the theories that we're working um, with are not uh, specific to some lo location. For example, in different cultures, even today, people can still uh, memorize or remember quite a whole lot about what has happened 40 or 50 years ago with great accuracy. So I'm just wondering if we're not imposing one um, way of looking at memory to antiquity. I would say no, because, because um, the, um, the, 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 I think the science on memory is, is showing increasingly that we actually, our memories, not even just ours, but even in, in, the, in uh, the cultures that you imagine, their memories aren't actually as, as um, picture perfect, a uh, Kodak, um, as we think, or as they think. I would just say, I think even that example, picture perfect Kodak, is a necessarily ethnocentric perspective. Yeah. That yeah. was the claim being made, that no, they're remembering point. with that, great accuracy. That was Kodak good. is great accuracy. That was not his point, I don't think. But he, he, okay, he said with great accuracy. But what, who determines what is accuracy? He did by <laughs> saying it was with great accuracy. But his point, but his point is that in that context, that's understood with great accuracy. I mean, it's, I think that the idea that we can go back and, I mean, what, what really, I wonder what these people in a lab are actually doing for the, for the type of traditions he's talking about. What is their standard for determining when there was de deviation? All you have is the tradition. You know, that, that's all you can work with. So, so, uh, I, 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 yeah, I, I think, think that, yeah, I think you get where, where I was coming from. Bob Miller! <laughs> I, I love a lot of what's said, but something I'm still missing, and it goes back to my traditional roots, is the F word, fiction, right? Uh, uh, it's not always a matter of a better or more accurate memory, but sometimes gospel writers, like all ancient historians, consciously make stuff up. How the hell did you miss that from what I said? <laughs> I used the word manufactured memory. Yeah, well that's okay. But that means that I'm not remembering anything, right? I'm making it up. That's
That's right. For the first time. Manufactured memory is complete fiction. That's a manufactured. But, that's but a what is it? But what is it? No, but that's a cop out. You no, it's it. not a cop out. It's, it's the post. It's, it's the postmodern historical cop out. No, it's a, It's all made up. So it's all. No, 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 no. That's not what. Oh, that's not what. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Whoa, 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 whoa. whoa. No, 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 that's not. Hold on, we've got a ridiculous claim on the table. <laughs> <laughs> there will be. But. <laughs> about documentaries for instance, and this is the problem with categories such as fiction. I can watch, uh, I can watch a History Channel um, uh, uh, documentary, and not even about something about Bible secrets being revealed or some <laughs> plot like that, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but something much more recent, such as such as World War II, and I, uh, so, uh, uh, for instance, World War II. And I can and I can watch multiple documentaries on this. And I can even, let's say, after doing historical research, grant that all, all of them are very accurate in the information that, that they present. The fact is that some documentaries are more compelling than others, and it's not just a fact uh, a, a factor of making stuff up. Or that there is creativity in the accurate telling of history, even as there's creativity in the inaccurate uh, uh, telling of history. So it's not a cop out to say, well, it's all it's all creative. It's all fiction in the sense of fifty of put together. It it all is that, and I'm not using that as a cop out, but I am saying that what we're what we're questing after is not the unfifty of history, the unmanufactured. And documentaries don't uh, don't do this, and and, and, and stories don't. So. And Paul, your answer to uh, to um, uh, Mr. Manet here fails to ask so many of the important historical questions about Jesus, such as, where does Matthew's apocalyptic worldview come from? Why would anybody think that what Matthew talks about was, an, uh, was a reasonable thing to be said about Jesus? Where do these things come from? Maybe they don't come from Jesus, but there's still questions to be asked, but you're not interested in asking them because you've decided that this is redaction. I'm done. All right, one final question, and for the love of all things holy, keep it short. Yes. <laughs> I'm working with a distinction between history as construction of the past or representation of the past, and past or event as what happened, what took place. But it seemed like you were using past not to mean what happened, what took place. How are you using past? But as I said in my paper, uh, in, in most social media discourse, when people talk about the past, they're talking about the pressure that the past puts on the present, whether that's historically accurate or historically inaccurate, uh, historically in, uh, inaccurate past. So e even fabricated uh, past still uh, pressure the present. They still <coughs> form the way people, uh, they still affect the way people form memory in the present. So you have a threefold distinction between the event, what happened, past, what impact in the present, and the history, the construction, or representation of the event. I, I don't know about the last part with history, but when, when I speak of past, I'm just talking about the inherited past. Uh, if, I, if I'm talking about what really happened, I would use the phrase actual past. And we could have, we could have a whole range of debate on how useful that term even is, but I, I, I would use it. Okay, well, um, thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. I'm very sorry for those who couldn't ask questions, but you try looking after four unruly children whilst trying to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think we should give a round of applause for some mild blood stuff. <laughs> <laughs>